Welcome back. So there is this interesting trope, meme, however you want to look at it with this channel. I will upload a news video and that news breaks as that video is uploading. Today, it's happened. And it's the first time it's happened in a long time. And it's interesting because from a news perspective, the NHL has been pretty quiet over the last couple of weeks. Outside of stuff going on on the ice, there hasn't been a lot off the ice to report on necessarily. Oh, Arizona, right. And now Toronto uh, making news by deciding not to bring back Kyle Dubas. The way this has been phrased, it definitely looks like the Leafs made this decision, that this was not Kyle Dubas deciding to walk away as much as it was them walking away from Kyle Dubas. Now, this was reported as a possibility by Chris Johnston, I believe on Steve Dangle podcast this past week. Uh, where he was talking about kind of a frosty relationship and things he noticed this season. I did see people calling him a hack and saying he didn't know what he was talking about. So I would hope that those people will apologize and say, actually, uh, Johnston may have had a point. I'm kidding. It's the internet. Of course they won't. Uh, that being said, Dubas being out, he is very young. He's 37 years of age. And one thing that I thought when Dubas took over in Toronto was, I understand he's really smart. I understand that... that the job of being a general manager in the NHL may not be rocket science, but there's there's certain certain aspects of the job that can be very trying. And so I can't imagine jumping into Toronto as the general manager uh, as your starting point in your early 30s. So I thought this was just an absolutely ridiculous idea from the beginning. And I don't mean it was ridiculous for him to hire Dubas. I mean... Wow, for him to have the guts to run the Toronto Maple Leafs as his first GM job in his early 30s. Now, he had been assistant general manager for Toronto uh, since 2014. And there's some speculation that the Leafs uh, may very well have been making room to bring up an assistant general manager to become the general manager because they don't want to lose him to another team. The problem is, um, in previous cases where that's happened, and I'm thinking of Vegas and Colorado... Usually the guy who's the general manager then gets bumped up to the president's position. Uh, Dubas, not so much. I, I guess Shanahan didn't want to promote him to his job, so he'd be out of work. But May 11th of 2018, Kyle Dubas became the Leafs GM. And, I mean, he, he is so young, comparatively speaking, with most general managers in the NHL. And it, it, was, it was odd. And... Uh, I I thought from the beginning he was fighting an uphill battle. So the Toronto Maple Leafs at the time he comes in in 2018, we were already into the stage of, okay, they're a good team. They're a contending team. How do they get over the hump? And taking over a team in that position might be the most difficult job because trying to figure out what the problem is, is one thing. But then Kyle Dubas uh, doubled down on the idea that he was going to keep this core together. And when it was, how in the world, you can't, you can't afford to keep all these guys together. His answer was, we can and we will. And he did. I, I will say for Kyle Dubas, he absolutely held up his end of the bargain there. That he promised these guys he wouldn't trade them, and he never did. Uh, now, we can have the debate about whether or not that was the right decision. But if he gets hired by another team, that's something that players on that other team are going to remember. They're going to remember that he was a man of his word. And in sports, that's important. And for a manager to have that kind of trust from his team is important. So did the Leafs win a Stanley Cup? No. They made it out of the first round once under his tenure. But I, I really like some of what he did here. I did think that his attachment to the players and his willingness to say, I will never trade these guys, I thought that might be detrimental to him in the long term. And here we are. So July 1st of 2018, he signed John Tavares. So he's he's less than two months into the job. Tavares signs a seven-year contract for $77 million in total. A lot of that signing bonuses. Uh, Kyle Dubas not shy about signing bonuses, not shy about no trade and no movement clauses. Whatever they want, the players generally have gotten from him. Now, whether or not players take full market value, that's a whole debate for another time. Tavares, word had it, he was he had higher offers from other teams and opted to sign with Toronto. But that $11 million at the time, I thought was odd because they already had Kadri as their number two center. And I felt like they needed to, to, to beef up the blue line a little bit. And that $11 million on the blue line could have done a lot. 
That being said, uh, February 5th of 2019, he signs Austin Matthews to a five-year extension for $58.1 million. The, the frustration with that contract wasn't as much the cap hit. The cap hit's high. It was the fact that it was walking him to unrestricted free agency. It wasn't signing him for eight years. And now we're a year out from Matthews being able to hit the market in his absolute prime. He is going to get paid if he hits the market next year. And so this is where whoever takes over from Dubas is going to have some headaches. Um, September 13th of 2019, he signs Marner to a six-year extension, $65.4 million. Same thing. Walks him to free agency. I think he bought a year of free agency with, with Marner. But right now it's standard. You give guys eight years. It's eight years. Um, now, if you sign them for less, maybe you get a bit of a break in, in what the cap hit is. But in exchange, they become free agents sooner. So in the case of both Marner and Matthews, they could both be going towards the end of their time in Toronto. And it's one thing that I, I, I do wonder if Shanahan has talked to the players about how they would feel. Does this affect their wanting to stay in Toronto? So for Matthews, if if he is, you know, really, really, really likes Dubas, and if he doesn't like this, this uh, revelation today that Dubas is out, does that mean that Matthews then goes to Shanahan and goes, you know, maybe I maybe I should go. Um, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but we have seen where you'll have a change in management and it may change the relationship between management and the players. And a new GM could come in and say, we have to completely revamp this. Uh, of course, December 1st of 2018, and I wanted to leave this one separate, William Nylander really held Toronto's feet to the fire ends up getting a six-year contract worth a total of $45 million. Now, Dubas at the time was criticized for this deal, which a lot of the money was up front. But it was the kind of deal that Toronto can do, right? Toronto can make this deal. And the cap hit for Nylander right now is the most tradable of the cap hits. I'm not saying he should be traded. I think he played well in the playoffs. I think honestly, of the core four that's talked about a lot, I think Tavares is obviously the one that would be preferable if you were able to move one of those core four. That being said, that contract is going to make it very difficult to move Tavares if that is to what Toronto decides to do. Uh, but Nylander would be the easier one to move. And on October 29th of 2021, Morgan Riley signed an extension with the Leafs, eight years, $60 million. So it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for these players. And then in trades, he has been trading away the future. Now, one trade that he kind of took a bath on a little bit was the Nick Foligno deal where part of what goes the other way, and I didn't put it on the board because there's such, so many pieces in that trade. But basically what it boils down to is they traded out a first in order to get Nick Foligno in, and it didn't work out. Nick Foligno uh, injured, and then it just, it just didn't work in Toronto, and then he ends up leaving, right? So... That one didn't age well, and of course we had the uh, the the mini series that went through that playoffs where they lost against Montreal, and there was the discussion uh, Paul McLean had about how it was you know it was between the years. Toronto's problem is it, it's it's a, a mental hurdle they're trying to overcome more than a physical one, and I, I don't know that they're completely over that. They did knock out Tampa Bay this year, but then you look at that series against Florida. I'm not sure they're really over that hump yet. I'm I'm I, I'm not sure. And I think that's part of the reason why we're here today talking about Dubas being out. So this trade deadline, I wanted to just look at what he, he did at this trade deadline. Uh, and then a few others as well. Uh, because this really speaks to where there are some good decisions and there's some iffy ones. So he traded a 2023 third for Luke Shen on February 28th. That trade worked out so, so well. So while the Canucks get a third for Shen, and I think they're happy with that, Luke Shen was excellent for Toronto. I think they need to keep bring him back. I do. Uh, Engvall was traded to the Islanders for a 2024 third. Engvall played excellent hockey with the Islanders. Um, scored more than, than Horvat did for the Islanders, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, but Engvall, it really clicked for him with New York. It wouldn't have if he'd stayed in Toronto. So that deal... Uh, did they lose that deal? I mean, they, they get a third round pick and, and Engvall wasn't a player they were likely going to keep anyways. The one that, to me, is still kind of a head scratcher is trading Rasmus Sandin. 
good young defenseman who gets to Washington and it just clicks. Going the other way, Gustafson and uh, Boston's 2023 20, first, which is the number 28 draft pick. So Gustafson comes to Toronto, doesn't get used a lot. Um, and, and the first round pick, it'll be interesting because they do still have that. That's the number 28 pick. It's a deep draft. Uh, the next GM gets to, you know, decide what to do with that. And they don't have very many draft picks this year. They traded a lot of draft picks. Toronto has been going all in at the deadline for the last three or four years. And I think we're starting to see, I'm not, it, it's not an erosion of the young players, but we're starting to see a lot of these picks going the other way. And some of those picks already project to be pretty good players. So that's that's the issue that we're going to start seeing is the media will start picking off, hey, this guy's debuting in the NHL. That was a Leafs pick they traded. This was a Leafs pick. And so that's that's something that's going to happen. February 27th, so the day before that, uh, they traded Joey Anderson, uh, Pavel Gogolev, uh, a 2025 first, which is top 10 protected, 2026 second in exchange for McCabe, Lafferty, a 2024 fifth, and a 2025 fifth. Uh, Lafferty played well. I thought McCabe was decent, but in that second round against Florida, he had his struggles, as a lot of Leafs did. Um, this is a trade that I think both teams are probably happy with the results. Again, even though Toronto loses in the second round, uh, McCabe was a solid addition for them on the blue line. I think you still do that trade, even knowing now what we didn't know then. I still think that goes through. On February 17th, so 11 days before the deadline, they acquired... Ryan O'Reilly, Noel Achari, and Josh Pilar. Going the, going the other way was the 2023 first of theirs, which is now the number 25 pick. So essentially, they have a number 28 pick instead of number 25. It's it's not really a bad trade-off. They also traded a 2024 second, a 2023 third. That was an Ottawa deal, or, or an Ottawa pick that we'll talk about in a moment here. Uh, Gaudette went the other way, as well as a 2025 fourth. So it's an expensive trade. It's an expensive trade, and it's a three-way deal. So I think that 2025 fourth went to Minnesota as they laundered the money. Uh, but the, the reality is that I think O'Reilly was part of the reason they made the second round. I think that was a decent pickup. Uh, I don't think they have the cap space to keep O'Reilly unless he wants to sign a team-friendly deal. And again, with a new GM, will they be more likely or less likely to want to do that? It will be interesting to see what happens. But I think Achari was good, too. I think Achari was an underrated pickup by the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, but last summer, there was the deal that left everybody kind of scratching their heads. And I think we still are. Uh, July, for, July 11th of 2022, they traded future considerations. So they didn't trade anything, but they acquired some money. In Matt Murray coming back, a 2023 third, which was then traded in the Ryan O'Reilly deal, and a 2024 seventh. So they picked up Matt Murray. He got hurt. It's what happens to him most seasons, it seems, which is too bad because Matt Murray, when he's at his best, can be very good. But between him and then signing Samsonov, the idea was, okay, well, these two can be good. Now, Samsonov was good in the playoffs, right? Then he gets hurt, and then there's Wall. Uh, now you're dealing with a situation where I think a lot of Leaf fans expect Wall to be the starter or the backup. If he's ready, great. If he's not ready for that, give him another year in the AHL and figure out what you're going to do with the NHL goaltenders. Samsonov has to come back. I, I don't know what you do with Matt Murray because that's a lot of money. This is a team that doesn't have a lot of cap space this summer, uh, in part because of how Kyle Dubas was, was, was running things. I'm not saying that's bad either because there are a lot of GMs that run it the same way. Uh, March 20th of 2022, they traded a 2022 second, 2023 second, and a 2024 third to Seattle for Mark Giordano and Colin Blackwell. Uh, Giordano has been solid for Toronto, stayed in Toronto this season. But yeah, that second round draft pick just signed a contract with Seattle and projects to be pretty good. So again, I, I understand trading the future for the now. Uh, but I, I do sometimes feel like Toronto was really aggressive. And I, I don't know if it benefited them either now or in the long term. And so that's one question that we'll, we'll know better as time goes on. Uh, it, it's not easy to do the Monday morning quarterback thing a year out or a month out. But once you get to four or five years out, you have a good idea which trades worked and which ones didn't. So for Kyle Dubas, I, I don't think he did a bad job in Toronto. 
I don't think he'll have any problem finding another job in the National Hockey League. And I, I do think that, you know, running the Toronto Maple Leafs is arguably the most difficult job in the National Hockey League for the fact that every every day there's going to be that micromanagement via media, via fans, just the amount of attention. And the expectations with Toronto were really, really high when Dubas took over. Um, I think if, if Dubas does move on to another job, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes into another pressure cooker. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to another team that's looking to get over the hump. Because I, I think that's what his desire is, is to prove he can win at the National Hockey League level. He showed it at other levels. Uh, the Marlies winning the Calder Cup is an example. Um, and in juniors, he's won as well. So he wants to win in the NHL. But I, I do wonder, might it be better for him to go into a completely different situation? Because again, he's young, he's still going through the process. And, and just have him part of a team that's building up. You know, uh, a team in a situation like a Detroit, like a, a an Ottawa, like a Buffalo. Just as I'm using those as an example of teams that are are getting their getting their game together and they're starting to get ready for maybe a playoff spot. A team like that would be good for Dubas, or a team that's in a rebuild, I think, could work for Dubas as well. Um, but I I think a blank canvas would be fun to see him work with because he didn't have that in Toronto. He really didn't. Uh, closest you could get is all that money that ended up going to Tavares. That's as close as you get. Uh, but he's he's out of the fishbowl now in Toronto. No longer part of the center of the universe. And we'll see where he ends up. Again, I, I really think he's going to end up being a GM again. Um, he did say in that press conference he wouldn't be GM anywhere else but Toronto next year. So he basically said he wouldn't want to be a GM this coming season. And that would make some sense. Um I would imagine that it was it was a uh, something being in that pressure cooker. It's not an easy job. It's just not an easy job, and uh, you know now he's got a decision to make from here about what's next. But if if he did come out and say, you know, maybe I maybe I could be a GM next year, teams would absolutely be calling him, and uh, I I think I think he'd make a really good amount of cash as a general manager wherever he ends up. But let me know your thoughts. Where do you think Kyle Dubas ends up? And as this is being uploaded, I'm sure somebody else will hire him because that's how the day is going to go today. But let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. And I guess the question I have is, was Kyle Dubas a good GM in Toronto? Let me know your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.